Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of our technology conference. And I'm going to talk about the, com the Mathematica compiler, the Wolfram Language compiler, and um, efforts that we've had for sort of compilation. So um, I'm going to review. Lots of you will know lots about the compiler. Maybe I'll ask a question first of all. How many people here use the Mathematica, the existing compile function? Right. Good. So that's, that's quite a good. Presumably for speed, that's your main reason. OK, that sounds good. So I'm, I'm just going to have a quick review of the Wolfram compiler. There might be some people here who are not familiar with it, just to make sure everybody knows where we're coming from and what's existing now. Um, I'm going to then switch on to talking about some new development efforts that we've been working on. And I'm going to try and not be too technical, um, but it will be a little bit technical, just to give you a warning. So, right. So, what is a compiler? Generally, a compiler can be thought of as something to translate computer source code from one programming language into another. But, but typically, you're going to translate from a high-level language into a low-level language for reasons, um, you know, for example, for execution. So you can translate your high-level language like C++ into a low-level language, the sort of machine code that runs on the Intel processor, and you can get faster execution. The low-level language might be simpler, able to execute faster. Um, the translation process itself very often optimizes things, removes unused code, etc. Um, very often in compilers, not, not always, it invokes a type system and that gives you some part of, there's a type system that's passed to the compilation and that gives you some sort of guarantee one of the features of a type system is it tells you that the program can always move forwards it won't it won't get stuck that there'll always be a root a function to move forwards compilation you can also work with other technologies multi-core things other compilers gpus other languages sometimes you can use Part of the concept of compilation is your understanding the code that's being compiled, and that can give you information, other information, warnings. You know, this variable's not being used. This, you know, the output of this complicated thing is not, is not being used. This, you know, and, and such like. This variable's not being initialized, might lead to an error. And it's a compiler that you need to understand the language to get warnings like that. And another type of thing, this is really like a translation thing, is refactoring. So to rewrite your code in some way, to do that correctly, you have to understand what it is. And that's what a compiler can do. So the Wolfram language compiler, um, just give a quick, it's just a quick demo. So it's a bit like, so we have, Lambda functions in Mathematica, so we also have, related to that, we have compile. So you just replace function with compile, that's the formal argument, and you execute it, and you get the, get the same, same answer, but it's taking two different routes to get there. It's actually the compiled function is using, so here's the compiled function, it's using, we can see the internals. And it's like a bunch of integers, a bytecode. A more useful way of looking at it is this sort of compile print. So here is the function. We had sort of x squared and sine of x squared. And then when we execute it, these are the actual instructions here that are being executed. So one thing you might notice is that it's only, even though x squared appeared twice, it's actually combined those. So it's only squaring the input variable once. So that's like an optimization, kind of a nice, nice optimization. Here's another more complicated one. This has 
This is a sort of table command, and this has been turned into a, you don't have to read all these instructions, but it's basically added a loop into the, in, 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 into the bytecode. Now, so our compiled functions, they're like an expression, and so we can write mathematical programs to work with it. And so one of the things we did um, was to add some code translation, and this is taking the compiled function and it's generating <coughs> C code from the compiled function. And this is C code that you can actually execute. And so we went one stage further, which was in compile. We added this compilation target goes to C. And so you get a compiled function, it executes. But this time, the compiled function, instead of using the bytecode virtual machine that's built into the system, it's actually dynamically generated a dynamic library, and it's calling into that. So that's making use of the Wolfram language tools for working with C compilers and LibraryLink. And another feature of compile is, if you can see this, is we have various we can make the compiled function be listable, and we can set it, set the parallelization true. And this is a very fine-grained form of parallelization of multi-core support in the kernel. And so it's able to, if there are multiple cores, it executes those in, in parallel. So just a quick, some quick explanations. So the normal usage is we have the Mathematica input, go into the compiler, and it creates a compiled function which has virtual machine instructions. When we set compilation target goes to C, it takes a different route, it goes to the compiler, that generates C code, that goes into a dynamic library, and the dynamic library is loaded, and that's, that's how it executes. For the parallel execution, so it's a listable compiled function, so the compiled function is applied to each argument in the list in, in sequence. So that's like listability in, in general in, in Mathematica. But since the compiled function has a more tightly controlled semantics, we, we're able to execute this in, in parallel. So here's the parallel execution. So this would be with two cores. So you would take, you know, you take two, two arguments from your list, give them in each, each thread, you'd execute those and such like. And of course, this, you know, this generalizes out if you had six cores or 16 cores, you can get a parallel acceleration from, from the compiled code. So this is something that's not available in the normal Mathematica interpreter e evaluator. It's too much state that it has, too much shared state would make it not, not work for compiled, um, for parallel execution. Right. Just Shunting on here, quick history. Initial version introduced in Mathematica 2, 1991. Version 3, we added tensors. So this is like full ranked. So this is like a matrix or a vector. Each, each length has to, each dimension has to have the same length. And um, this was very useful, very powerful. It made, made the compiler much more useful to be able to compile things like this, partly because with this, we were able to compile a lot of the language. So, and in fact, we, we automatically invoke, for things like table and such like, we automatically invoke compile. Um, version four, we added this packed array notion, which was taking the tensor concept and letting these tensors sort of leak out of compile into the rest of the system, and that's what packed arrays were. And then the Another advance was in the code generation and parallel execution, and that was added in version 8. So quick. Now, let's look at some challenges and such like. So, so the Wolfram language is a very dynamic language. So, so in your compiler, you want, you know, it's helpful to have some sort of type system, but, but Mathematica doesn't have doesn't have, you know, has like runtime typing. So you don't really know the type of something until the code is executing. Compile gets around this by adding the types on the input to the, to the function, and then it infers 
does a type inferencing system to sort of deduce the types in, 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 in the code. Um, another type of issue for the Wolfram language is its symbolic nature. Now, for compilation, it's not necessarily a problem, but if you have things that bind values later, and, and that's actually sort of a feature of infinite evaluation, that, that is a problem, because it means you don't, at compilation time, you don't necessarily know what your code is. Of course, compilers have ways around, you know, of, 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 of dealing with things like that. And then there's other challenges, specific features, like up values and sequence, and, and things like that. So those are some of the challenges. And then here are some of the limitations. And I know about some of these limitations because some of you folk here have told me, how do I do this? How do I do that? So these are some of the limitations. A lot of these do, do relate to the type system. So it only works for simple types, booleans, integer, real complex, and tensors of the numeric types. So it doesn't support like strings or association or big nums or 16-bit unsigned integers or, you know, et cetera. It doesn't support those, but that, 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 that would be useful. You can't define types. If I wanted to introduce, you know, like some structure or record, you can't, you can't do that. The type system doesn't have any notion of types. So, so I'll talk about those a bit more later. It doesn't support function types. So you can't, it supports function in compiled code, but it purely inlines the function. So it can't pass a function around. And even more usefully is that function that's passed around, it doesn't keep, you know, it doesn't keep its binding to variables. And that's a very powerful concept that makes a thing called a closure. It's not very good for one compiled function calling another. And in particular, it's not very good for recursive calls. So it's like old Fortran 77, which didn't support recursion. So it doesn't integrate with the pattern matcher. It's hard to extend, either by you or by us. And it doesn't really use the latest knowledge of compilers or, 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 or technology. So in order to work on this, we have been, for a long time, I have been thinking that it would be nice to, I'm just going to, that it would be, there'd be a lot of potential. Compiler's a very useful pe feature. A lot of people get good, good utility out of it, but um, we're, we're missing something. And the old compile system come to end of its life. It's hard to sort of build on top of. What we need is a new development project to work on <clears throat> a new, you know, second generation Wolfram language compiler. And I'm giving you, this is a work in progress. So this is a development project that's been going on for about, bit over, about a year. I've, we've had various efforts before that, but this is a really serious effort. Um, one of the things that's actually helped in this is the new feature association that's, that was added in version 10. And that allows us, helps us to write, develop new programming paradigms that are, that are useful for this. Another feature of the new compiler is that it's very much built on top of principles of compilation technology and techniques. So it uses you know, modern compiler knowledge and techniques, and it's very compatible with modern compiler technologies, in, in particular this, this thing called LLVM, and I'll, I'll be talking about that. So the task, what's the task? I'm going to go through the steps in, 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 in the compile. So we're translating Wolfram language into a form that can be executed more quickly. Um, so we're going to start with a tree-structured Mathematica expression, which will be a Mathematica program, and we're going to convert that into a linear sequence of instructions. So how are we going to do that? So the first thing we have to do is we need to have a way of representing the syntax tree of the Mathematica expression. 
But we have to do this in a way that it doesn't sort of evaluate from under, underneath you. And this is something, there's all sorts of tricks and things that people around here have, have introduced. The way that we went to do, solve this was to have a, a radically different, like a whole new data structure built out of um, associations that represented the expression. And that makes it completely easy to work on the, um, to, 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 to work on these expressions. So we call them M, M experts and they support you know, things like much of the API, the, the programming interface for, for expressions. So I can get like the first part. So the first part is, is this. I can go back into a regular expression if, 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 if I want to. So another thing that we did was that there are nice concepts in, in the Wolfram language, like pattern matching. So, so what we did was we, we wrote a pattern matcher that operated, that supported Mathematica programming pattern constructs on these MXPers. So this is a match queue function. So it's matching against this, and it's using this as the pattern. And we match that, and we get the answer true. So that's, that's good. Um, and we have another, this is like a replace all. So this is everything that matches this pattern. Um, it's, it's going to replace that. So let's do a bit more. If I come and put, here's another. So it's very much like the Mathematica pattern matcher, but it's, but it's a different implementation. And this came out of something that um, I implemented quite a while ago for Workbench, which also has a pattern matcher, and that's able to do refactoring and searching in your Wolfram source code using Mathematica pattern language, which is kind of a cool thing. This is using a pattern matcher, which you know, manipulates these syntax trees, um, and I'll show you why that's useful in, in a minute. Well, in less than a minute, I'll show you useful now, because the reason that we want to do that is we want also to have a macro system. So the old compiler, has, has a macro system that some of you, I know that like Oliver, for example, has delved into this. It grew up organically. It's a bit opaque. It's a bit hard to work with. And this is a much more fundamental thing. And the idea of the macro system in compiler is you, you rewrite some of your code. So you don't need, you see, it's because we're lazy and we want to go and read Wikipedia or, or you know, do something different with our lives or, or look at, you know, so we don't want to write translations into our compilation code for every function. All we do is we write it for a subset, and then we translate other things into that subset. So here's, for example, an and. And I'm going to write, um, I'm going to expand the macro. And so we've turned the and into a, another expression and so this other expression is the thing that will combine, uh, that, that, will, that will compile. So we don't need to write compilation for and, we just need to you know, make, make, make it work on this sort of branching. Here's um, another one. So this is like this inequality thing. So this actually goes through two steps. So first of all, it turns into an and of these two um, equality, inequality expressions, and then the and has, has sort of, you know, expanded. So this is how we've um, implemented the um, system. There's still the macro system for people who are aficionados in this. It's, it's um, you know, it still has a little bit more work. It might need to introduce local variables to prevent side effects, things like that. It might also, if it introduces local variables, it needs to do that in a way that doesn't conflict with the system that's around that. But, but there are, these are well-understood problems that, you know, they're not specific to, to Mathematica or from language. Right, that's the macro system. Now, what we want to do is we want to take <coughs> the input. So here I'm giving, the input is being a compile expression, but I'm going to work with it in, in this new system. And this runs along here, and it's generated this thing called a program module. 
And the program module contains a list of all of the individual functions. The reason for this is that inside this compiled function, we might have other, other functions inside of this. And, and the way to compile that is you lift all the nested functions up to the top, and then you have a way of reaching them. But this, this one here only has one, has a function module, and then inside of it, it's got some instruction. It's got a list of these. Now, it starts to get a bit opaque. I'll talk about what these are in a minute. But here's a, another way of looking at it. And so here's the, the code for this very simple function, 2x plus 1. So we're loading the argument. We're multiplying the um, uh, constant. This is the constant 2. And we're multiplying it by the input variable, the, the, the variable there. Then we're going to do an addition, and then we are going to return the result. Now, this, this code has a couple of properties, um, and I'll show you one more property that it has. So here I've got a branch, and I'm showing you this now in a, in a different printing form. Now, what this branching has done is it's, it's split the program sections into blocks. And these are things called basic blocks. And the property of the basic block is you, you never leave or enter in the middle. You enter at the top and you exit out at the bottom. That's, that's how it works. So this, there are, there are these, <coughs> it has four basic blocks. So it starts up here, and then there's, it either goes to this one or it goes to this one, and then they end up at this sort of ending, ending result. Now there's another property that this code, this is probably getting too technical, but each each of these variables only ever gets assigned to once. So you only assign to variables once, and that's very useful. And the reason why you want to do that is it makes any transformations or optimizations or whatever is very simple to, to, to do because you don't have to, if, if a variable was assigned to in many places and you wanted to remove that variable, you'd have to keep track of it. It would be much harder. Each one only has one, one usage. So here's a slightly more complicated input function. And here we go. And so this is, this is a while. So we have to support a few of these. Of course, many things will use the macro system to turn them into ifs and whiles and things like that. So that, that, that makes it simpler. So we've also added a bunch of optimizations to the system. So here's the same thing, but I'm setting the optimization level to zero, and there's, you know, there's, a, there's many more instructions. You see down here, there's, there's kind of like a, a copy instruction. You see we're copying 14 to 15, and then we're returning it, but in fact, we could just return, you know, return something. Then a final step is we're going to convert everything into, out of this single assignment form into a sort of register allocation um, thing, and that's where we, we might actually reuse the same, the same register. And this uses a, a, a standard algorithm for um, allocating uh, registers. Right. So that's the, I've shown there, starting with an input expression and then converting it into this sort of intermediate code. Now, before we actually go into the sort of outside, you know, to take it further, to start executing it, we, we, we need to have a type system. And so this is some view into the type system that, um, I've, that, 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 that I'll give you now um, that, 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 that we've been developing. Now, type systems themselves are very interesting, and there's, you know, there's probably more people here that know about mathematics and logic than computer science type systems, but actually they're the same thing, and there's a correspondence between logic and type systems that's actually very interesting. And I think in general, any parts of computer technology that touch pure maths, as opposed to, you know, that have this correspondence, I think that's enormously interesting. So, and, and the type system itself is like a programming language, but it's a higher level programming language where you, you, you do reasoning about the um, code that you have. So the type system we have, it has 
specification of basic types, like the old type system, but it has more of them, and you can introduce new ones. It has a type inferencing system, but a more, you know, a more modern, more robust type inferencing thing. It has type extension, so you can add compound types, um, function types. Uh, it has, which is very useful, it has a notion of generic types. So in terms of logic, I think that's going up to first order logic, where you have quantifiers. There's, there's this correspondence that's, that's, that's there. And um, so here's just some quick, quick idea. So this is like an integer. And here is a compound type. So this is the thing that we, how we specify packed arrays. You, you don't have to type this in. This is all the internal mechanism. So this is a, we're applying this type vector, and we're applying it to the argument integer. So this is a type, this is a packed array of rank one of integer. And of course, you can nest these things. So if we added, applied another type vector to that, we'd have a matrix, a rank two packed array. So this is, this is how the type system would um, reference them. This is the name that we give to um, a function type. So this is the type of a function that takes a real argument and returns an integer. So very useful to have functions in, in the type system. Um, here's a type, um, another type of atomic type. So this is a 32-bit integer. Very nice to be able to specify that in, in, in a formal way. And, and one important note, none of these, these, these names, of course, this 32-bit integer, that's just a name. So there's nothing in it that says it's holding 32 bits. It's just a name that gets sort of propagated through the system. Um, but, but none of these are hard-coded, and it's, 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 it's quite general. So let's just have a little look at the inferencing system. So here I'm going to, I've made a function that takes an integer and returns a real. And now what I've done is I've made a function that takes an integer, but now the, the output is an unknown. So I, I don't know what the output is. So you do this in type inferencing. So now I'm going to unify, that's the name that you give to, to this, these, these two functions. And now, when I look at the output variable, it's actually, it tells me that the output variable is a real. So this is telling me that, you know, if, if I call this function with a, an integer, the output will be a, a real. So that's, that's pretty useful. Um, here's, here, here's another thing. So this is something that I'm invoking a quantifier. So this is, I have a function here, and this is a function, and it takes um, a generic type variable, and it returns that same variable. This is the type. It doesn't mean, so this would be a function that took an integer and returned another integer, and, or a function that took a real and returned a real, or a list and a list. So this might be an identity function. But it isn't, it's not saying it's returning the same thing, it's just returning a thing of the same type. So now I'm going to do, um, do a type inference on this. So I unify. So I'm going to combat, combine it with a function that takes an integer, but I don't know what the output is. So I combine this, and if I look at the output variable, it's an integer. So that's, 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 that's pretty useful. So this is a generic, generic function. So that's, that's pretty useful. In the old compiler, we had to write special case code for things like this. So now we have a language that deals with these things sort of, you know, that's much more expressive. So that's, that's definitely, definitely better. And of course, you, you, you can go up, you know, in you can go, there's higher levels of, of, of logic that, 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 that you can go to if, if you need to. Generic functions. Right, after we've reached the intermediate code, we start applying optimization passes. And this is, uh, Ab Abdul made this picture here. This is, at, at the current time, these are the optimization passes that, we, that, we, that we're applying. 
So for example, here's a thing to, oh, you'd have to go and look at this To The first one is we're looking at doing something with function slots. And then this is a pass, this def pass is something that tells whether something is defined. This is something that tells whether it's used. This, this pass here finds the range over which variables are, are in use. That's, that's needed, for example, for the, the register allocator and um, various things. You know, this thing here uh, avoids, you know, you know, moving constants around. It can just put the constant in its use place and then eliminate variables. So there's, there's like a bunch of these, um, you know, you can merge blocks and remove jumps and things like that. Working with this sort of static assignment and basic block structure makes these passes easier to work with. So another thing that's kind of neat about working with this that's been is, of course, you know, we're developing a compiler, but it's developed in Mathematica. So we can use Mathematica for doing um, uh, the, I'm not, oh, there we go. right, I've lost, I've lost my flow graph there. Um, but uh, we can use some sort of visualizations and things. And so here's, this is a function here. This is how you might write in, in Mathematica with fixed point, how you might write a um, fractal to sort of compute a Julia set. So this is the various instructions that, that, that we might go down into. Right. Now. This, this intermediate code that we have is fine for transforming and such like, but really we want to execute it, and so we need a back end, you know, we need to translate this into some sort of bytecode for an actual machine. So, so one thing that we've done is we've supported with the implementation we have, we've, we've built it to support um, the existing Mathematica virtual machine. So, so we have this to compiled function, and it's taking compile and it's returning a compiled function, which executes in, in the normal way, except, and it's nice, you know, sort of optimized code, except that this one here was, was done with our new system, not, not, not with the old system. And, and this has been pretty useful for sort of experimenting and innovating with, 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 with functions. Now, <clears throat> one of the goals that I gave for the system was to work with, you know, more, you know, more, more, more types. So not just integers and reals. And so one of the things that we did was we added support for um, strings. So here's a compiled function. And now what I'm saying is the argument is a is a string, and then I'm going to apply the string join function. And so if I call, you know, call this, I get, you know, get, get the, um, and I could compose this, you know, with other, other functions. And if we look at the instruction code, here's the, um, here's, here's the byte code. So it's pretty simple. The input is, is a string, and that's held in, held in this sort of, O zero, and then that calls the string join function, and that returns the um, you know re re returns the output. And I think adding strings to compile is like super useful actually. But we'd also like to go further and support associations, strings, and and your, your your own types as well. But but to have that in a in in in, in an efficient way. So sure. Yeah, right, right, right. So that's, that's something that, that we haven't implemented yet. So for reasons of trying to finish something and deliver something, we're, we're, we're looking to target the existing compile framework, which is for anonymous functions similar to lambda functions. That's, that's, but there's absolutely no reason why, why not. And, and 
uh, you know, I, I, think I can talk more about that later, but that's absolutely one of the goals, is to integrate. And, and actually, when you're compiling things, you actually know if you can see all the patterns you have to match against, probably maybe you can statically select which, which function to use. You know, you don't have to go and apply an expensive pattern matching, you know, implementation. So absolutely, that's, that's a feature. It's just... I, I don't have an example, you know, we, we haven't worked on that because we're focusing on finishing something, you know. That's so, what are the, so in the string thing like down the bottom, you've got string string or the, you know, I'm calling an internal function, yeah. string join, and I'm saying it takes two arguments, right. string string, and it returns a string. Right. So that's just the name. Up. That's a, that's like I'm making an external call to a built-in function. But that compound expression will have a type. So the mangling would have the name of that, be the name of that type. Well, the name mangling, it has to be, well, it's a string, so it has to be a valid, you know, C or something name. So, but, and, and we, maybe we'll need some aliasing thing to give, to give the types names or something. So, right. Yeah, right, right. I mean, these names might get quite long. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, I, I just put this into, right. Now, this is similar but a little bit different. So this is, I'm taking compile, and what I'm doing now is I'm saying everything that the compile is working for is going to be an, an expert, an expression might not mean everything to everybody here, but for some people, it will. So this is a compiled function, and I can call it, you know, right, I'm just adding to, adds its arguments. But, but this compiled function, it's, it's taking expressions, not, not integers or reals or something. So that means it can work for, for any expression. So here's, here's, here's a big num. The same same function, or here's you know some some sort of symbolic thing. Let's see. There's the code. So this is you've got sort of e two arguments e zero e one, and we're going to add them together. And here's a slightly bigger example, not super big, but so I'm going to compile this. And some optimization of the optimization is needed. Um, and so I can call this compiled function. Again, here's the code we have. And so it's, what do we have here? We're calling the less on the expression. Here we're casting the expert to a Boolean to implement the um, branch. This, this, this is in a loop. So, and then, and then we're doing some addition. You know, what are we doing? We're adding one of the, yeah, this is the counter, and we're going down to the loop, and then we're, and this actually, this simple example, just to show you, this is running, so this is how you'd write the same function without the compiler. And actually, quite, quite nicely it runs, you, you get kind of a nice speed up. Now, I haven't shown a lot of speed examples, you know, speed up, but, but I think this is, this is really quite interesting. And this is maybe the most profound thing in the mathematical language for sort of, first, you know, however long it is, you know, years. Because this is executing expression code without using the expression interpreter, the AST interpreter that we normally use, but using a, you know, a... a, a a, a, you know, an alternative system that's, that's, that's faster. And you can save a ton of work with, with, with this sort of thing. And this, so I'll, I'll answer, answer your question in a minute, but this, this lends itself very well to small little functions. So compiling all of Mathematica is quite, you know, is quite, 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 quite challenging. But, you know, I might have something, you know, list, you know, this might have something like this. So I might want to sort something, give a special sort function. 
Now, very often, when I write code, I, I sometimes avoid writing these sorts of things because I know that the applying the custom function, just invoking this custom sort function is going to be expensive. And it'll be more expensive than the built-in things which are written in C. But if we could compile these things and execute them in some efficient way, it would be as though they were written in C and it would make these things faster. That's in, you know, obviously maybe we could even run the sort function in the, in, in, in compile as well. But just being able to invoke small functions in an alternative way and get a speed enhancement, I think is very powerful and I think that will have a good impact on the utility of, of the system. So, I think that's quite exciting. If there are up values, it won't work. It won't work. No, it doesn't fall on the floor, it'll just go back. It can always go back to the old system. And so it, it'll absolutely, if you throw in sequence up values, it'll use the old system and it'll work correctly in the same way that it always did. Well, the, 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 the entrance to the compile would detect that up values are attached to things. And we have expensive machinery in the system to, to, to detect these things. So if you have those, it'll, you'll get the right answer. You won't get any benefits. So, right. But actually, when you start to use these things, it's not so up values become less useful as well, actually. So you can actually reach a world where up values are not useful. You, you, the, the reasons why you, you search, you reach for them, no longer exist because there's, it, it's fast enough with, without them, you see. Right. Uh, Seth, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, right. And I'm keeping it as a symbolic thing, yes. And executing it. And, and I think that's very powerful, right. Now, in general things, that's, you know, as Jason came up with something, and I'm sure, you know, you, you could just keep a you know, long stream of these things. Yeah, ain't going to work for these complicated things. But when you go and look at the, you know, 500,000 lines of Mathematica code that are in the system, you know, many of, you know, 499, you know, 500,000 lines of code, I would guess 499,900, you know, whatever, many of those lines of code, you know, they, they don't use features. They're going to st stop, stop compilation. And probably that's, that's the same case for, you know, for many of you. Even then, it's not impossible to imagine some sort of, you know, sort of JIT system where you start to detect that, you know, I mean, so it, it's not impossible. That's how you know, like JavaScript compilers work, you know, is they, JavaScript doesn't know what, what it has. So it sort of runs the code, collects statistics, and it says, oh yes, this function's been called 100 times with a, you know, an object that's, you know, has an integer and a string. I'll go and JIT create a specialized version that's optimized for this. So that, 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 that you know, those sorts of things are possible. So, but not, 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 not immediately. People that write compiled code as well now don't, don't, don't suffer from, you know, the, the, the lack of that. Now, just keep, keep an eye on. Um, I want to talk now about the sort of very back end, the execution of the, of the um, code. Well, maybe not the execution of the code, but... So I, I want to talk about this thing called LLVM. So this is a compiler infrastructure that provides a large collections of compilers and compiler tools that work with all sorts of different input languages and output targets, and output languages as well. And the really key, key point about LLVM is it's carefully written, something that might be familiar to Mathematica, it's it's, it's very carefully designed to be reusable and very carefully designed to be extensible. So it has a big contrast. In some ways, it's a little similar to GCC, but it's nicely designed. So I sometimes think of it, if we built a compiler, if we built, so it's like, 
If we were going to build GCC, it's how we would build it, or I, I would hope we would. And that's, that's, that's a very key point about LLVM, is that it's nicely designed, and it has these nice APIs, and so you can use it and extend it. Uh, right at the middle, it has this well-defined intermediate representation. Um, so LLVM, how many people here use a Mac? Good. So on the Mac, for quite a long time, LLVM has been part of the standard tools that you use for C code generation. How many people here use C on the Mac? Yeah, right. So, so some of you use C on the Mac. Maybe some of you are stubborn and you've installed GCC, but very likely you're using the Clang compiler tool chain. And Clang is part of the LLVM set of tools. And I think now, you know, maybe even a few years ago, Clang was, you know, it wasn't quite as fast as GCC. I don't think that's any, you know, that's, that's not true any longer. It's, it's, it's really nice and fast. Um, so, so Apple have a big investment in LLVM, but it's, it's, I think every big company, software technology company, are buying into LLVM and adapting some of it. So like, for example, Microsoft have this sort of, there's, they have, I'm not an expert on Mono and their, their common runtime, but I think they're making some new version of Mono that's based around LLVM. And there's a ton of tools that work with LLVM. Like when you do debugging on the Mac, you're not using GDB, you're using LLDB, you know. And so that means if, if you're working with the intermediate representation, you've got a debugger for it immediately. You don't, you don't need to write a debugger. You just, just use LLDB. So, and there's just a ton of tools for working with LLVM, translating it, um, you know, sort of, et cetera. And it's very, so why is it relevant for us? So it's, it's very suitable for integrating with our compiler project. And, and, and the compile project that I'm describing has been carefully designed, not totally accidentally, to be very compatible with LLVM. So many of the concepts that I've been talking about, these basic blocks and static, those are passes and things like that. Those are ideas. Those are sort of, you know, concepts in LLVM. So here's just a little snippet of the, really you don't have to look at this in too much detail. And sometimes when I put code like this up, half the people walk out, but apologies. So this is the intermediate representation of, this is the intermediate language that LLVM uses. So here's a, this is like an add to, this is kind of the meat of it, an add to function. So we're basically, it's a function that returns a integer 64, takes two arguments, it's going to add them, and it's going to return them. There's all sorts of other metadata and stuff like that, but that's, um, you know, things like this. No unwind. I think that means it doesn't throw any exceptions, things like that. And in this intermediate code, there's a ton of functionality. You, you can have there's support if you want to add a garbage collector to this, which we will need to support these string objects and things like that. It's, it, it's all been thought of, and there's a mature set of things um, for this. Here's an IR with a branch. So this is, you know, this is just a simple thing. So it's a function. I shouldn't have called it add to, sorry. What Take intermediate representation. This is the intermediate code, but you see it has the same concept of these basic blocks. So, so what we have is very compatible with this LLVM intermediate representation. So, so you have this LLIR VM, well, you know, so what to do with it, you know, so what? Well, you can take it, you can run optimizations, and the LLVM tools come with a ton of optimizations that are suitable or transform things or, you know, you know, clever, you know, there's, the world is stuff full of computer science departments who, who study these things and produce, you know, code that's compatible with it, and so we can work with it. Um, you can convert it into other languages, so there's things like, well, well, one thing that's actually quite useful for us is there are tools to take IR and convert it back into C. That helps us sort of study it, or we can incorporate it into other tools such like that we have. 
there are projects, there's a thing to generate CUDA code, GPU code. There's this mscriptum thing that generates JavaScript code. So once you're going into this IR, you've, you've got a lot of options open to you. But one nice thing you want to do is you want to execute it. And there's this thing called LLVM JIT. And this takes the, this intermediate code and it generates a function pointer that you can execute and call. And that's pretty nice because it means you don't have to go through a linker, you see. So you're saving a ton of work because a C compiler generates like an object file or a library or a shared or static library. And then it invokes another program that assembles all these things. And, but it just totally cuts that out. You don't need any, anything like that. But it's very, you know, it's as optimized as though it went through the linker, which, 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 which is pretty nice. So in order to, this is like super new stuff. And it, uh, we don't quite have everything I wanted to show. But even this is very nice. So we, we're starting to work with a, a link to LLVM tools. And so this is taking the, the add to intermediate representation that I had before. And I'm passing it to a function that invokes LLVM tools. And it returns this LLVM function. And I can add two numbers together using, whoops, didn't like that, and, and such like. Now, this IR I actually generated by run, running Clang. Obviously, we want to generate the IR ourselves. Just not quite working yet. But here's like an explanation that's really kind of key. What I'm showing here is this is virtually identical to putting compilation target goes to C. How many people here use compilation target goes to C? Right. So you will never have to do that again. It will just happen automatically for you, which is kind of nice. But you won't have compilation target goes to C has some negatives. Like you have to invoke this big complicated thing called a compiler. And sometimes that can be kind of slow. I think Rob had Rob Knapp found something once and it took like three hours to, <laughs> for Visual Studio. He had some monstrous finite, you know, the sort of monstrous thing that Rob had big thing. Even with, you know, the nice expression optimizer, it took three hours for Visual Studio to compile it. So of course, once it had been compiled, it ran very fast. But that's, this, this, this is kind of a, you know, an alternative. And you'll have, um, you know, solutions to sort of, you know, it's a more streamlined way of, of doing it. So it's similar to compilation target goes to C, but it's much, much simpler and much easier to, um, to control. Right, so I think I'm just coming to the end and I'm going to sort of wrap up. I mean, there's tons more things that, that I could be talking about. Um, this is definitely a you know, work in progress. This isn't finished, but I think we're starting to see all the bits that we need to put together. So just summarize, I, I looked at the existing compiler and its features and benefits and some of its weaknesses. And then <clears throat> I looked at some of the tool, the, the path, the route of the new Wolfram compiler and the, the sort of path that it took from going from Mathematica code to things that would, could be executed. Um, how this is destined to be a replacement for the existing compile functionality, a second generation compiler. It'll have support for you know, new types and experts. Um, and then I looked at how we are going to integrate, you know, output into and integrate with the LLVM technology. And I think this will be a really exciting new direction to take uh, the, the Wolfram language in. And we'll get some nice benefits from this. Anyway, so I'll, I'll wrap up. Th thank you very much. <laughs>